Let, let me begin with a, a small apology that I was not seven minutes earlier. That, uh, th this is the difficulty of having a class beforehand where uh, my students would have been happy if I had stopped earlier than I did. But, uh, well, we're happy you're, you're here. I'm right? delighted I'm to be to here. I'm ask you a few of the questions that the, um, sure. the students have asked. Uh, one question is what should a player do if they believe an athlete or a coach is not ethically following the rules? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, it depends on the kind of violation, you, you know, uh, the, the kind of thing that they're doing against the rules. And, you know, and you, you've got a range of cases where in, in some instances you have things like you know, the, the Penn State situation appears to have been where there was sexual abuse of mi minors, you know, uh, that's pretty major. Uh, you have some things that are related to the influence of money. So, for example, on a collegiate level, um, institutions giving athletes money when uh, that clearly violates the, the NCAA rules. Um, you have other instances where it's a little harder to tell, you know, uh, to what extent is a coach, for example, playing favorites. You know, I mean, in a sense, the core idea behind athletics is that talent rises to the top and that, you know, the, the best people are the ones who are doing the best. And, and when people second tier are rising up because they're friends with the coach or something like that, then, you know, you've got a different kind of violation where probably whistleblowing isn't the, the thing to do, you know. And I think with a lot of these things, it requires two um, distinct but related skills. One is to be able to see what's going on clearly. And often when you're in the middle of it, you know, it's hard to get that distance to see it. And then the second is to know how to act in a wise manner in relation to this, you know, do you, for example, go directly to the coach, to the or or to whoever it is that's that's involved? Do you go to an outside source? Do you go to an administrator? Do you go to the newspaper? You know, there are a variety of ways. And one of the hardest things to learn in life, for which unfortunately there isn't a rule book, you know, is not simply to know this is wrong, but also when you find something that's wrong how best to respond, you know, and to respond in a way that ultimately will bring out of a bad situation some genuine goodness. And that's tough, you know, that's a real challenge for us to face. You mentioned Penn State. Yeah. You wrote uh, yeah. a uh, column on Penn State, and you posed the question about uh, are we asking the right ethical question? Yeah. Given the time that you wrote the column, and probably four or five months ago? Yeah. And the situation right now, have they asked the right questions in your mind? Uh, well, let me first set the context. I ended up uh, writing that because one of my students after class came up and asked me about it, you know, and, and I th thought, I don't have a good answer. You know, I should sort of do something to try to figure out uh, what I think about this. And, and so, uh, and the way I think is to, that I write. You know, and so I wrote something up and then I sent it to the UT and the like. Um, I think that it's, the jury's probably still out on that. You know, it's, l let me say a bunch of different things, only some of which I said uh, in the op-ed because of constraints of space. You know, one of them is that it's important not to judge people on the basis of a single thing in an entire career. You know, I mean, that, we're all flawed. You know, it's, it's just, we vary how much and when, but we're all flawed, you know? Uh, and and uh, what I particularly had hoped Paterno would do was not to have undone the past, that was beyond his, his capability, but to step forward and say, look, it stops today. And the rest of the time I'm here, I devote my life to making sure we understand how this could have occurred at a really good place. And it, 
you know, Penn State has historically been a really good place, and how it will never happen again. You know, so it wasn't about the past, but how, but I, would, I remember seeing subsequent to writing the, the op-ed, this was three or four days afterwards, and seeing uh, a videotape of Paterno cowering in the back seat of uh, his station wagon as someone was driving him home, you know, and it just broke my heart. You know, I mean, here's a man who, you know, in many, many other ways, you know, did so much for so many. And to see him reduced to that, and it's not fair in certain ways to have life's greatest challenge come so close to the end, you know? So, so I have a, a mixture of different things, all of which I think are true. You know, it's not like if you say one thing's true, the other's got to be false, you know? You can say all those and still say this was a terrible thing, and it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have continued to happen. Some of the students have posed the question, uh, are sports today more corrupt than they have been in the past? And is part of that the fact that they're more exposed to the media and less is hidden? Yeah. Um, you know, one, you'd like to think that more media exposure would actually make things less corrupt, you know, because they're being more closely examined. But, but the combination, I think, of media exposure and money together has really made this a very um, difficult situation to handle. I mean, there is so much big money, and big money in college sports as well as professional sports, uh, that it's, it's just all out of disproportion to the love of the game, you know, which is not to say that there aren't still players, perhaps plenty of players who, out there who play ultimately because they love to play ball. You know, I mean, it's, you know, so one thing that lights up their life. But, but the whole process gets distorted by media, which is constantly watching them and inflating them. And sometimes, you know, they, they come to believe their own media hype. You know, I always am particularly uh, suspicious of those athletes who refer to themselves in the third person. <laughs> You know, <laughs> as, yeah, as though they're describing some, you know, force of nature that has come through the world, you know. There's, you know, Hurricane Katrina and then there's me, you know. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's that big money. And, and I think it varies from sport to sport, you know. Uh, think about the ways in which, uh, you know, if you look at baseball, you know, baseball has a great farm system. You know, and you, you come up, the, the, you know, it, it really, they, they try to watch it carefully. You, know, you look at the farm system for the NBA. It's colleges and universities. I mean, it, you know, same thing with the NFL. You know, we are the farm system. And, and that's not what we should be. You know? And there's so much money there that no one is going to bite the bullet and have genuinely... Um, you know, genuinely amateur athletics. So that's amateur athletics is something that's past? That well, it, we, may, we may call it that, but... Yeah, but, it, well, I mean, you know, it, it, it will still be true in certain areas, you know, but, but it won't be true in basketball and football, you know, in college. How will it be true if we went... If Looked at it by division, that is more likely. To yes, be I think right. I th two or three schools. Yes, and I think there's much to be said for the division two and three, okay. you know, and where you get people who genuinely play because that's what they want to do. But they're they're not looking for a pro career. They're not, you know, it's it's not about the money. It's about the game. And uh, the other thing that I think has changed is the way in which the sophistication of uh, not only training, but something that sort of blurs the line about what's admissible and what isn't. Uh, this is not quite cheating, but uh, you know, when do you allow certain kinds of enhancements? You know, and this is, uh, this is an issue in lots of sports and uh, even some, uh, 
here's one uh, sort of minor example, though it wasn't minor to those who were involved. Um, you know, if you're a professional uh, classical musician, you may uh, take certain statins to control a tremor in your hand. You know, so if you're a cellist or something like that, that's really important. Uh, if you take those same statins and you are competing, say, an Olympic archery event, you can, as two um, medal winners were, be disqualified when the tests come back. You know, and if you take testosterone, well. You know, that will be performance enhancing, unless, of course, you've had testicular cancer, in which case you have to take it as under a medical, you know, and you start to see how the line gets fuzzy, let's say. I'll give you four, four words, and you just put it together okay. as, you, as you might. Character, sports, culture, ethics. Oh. Well, I'd certainly put character and sports together in the sense that at its best, what sports tries to do is to build character. And I think if you look at the experiences of many um, in high school and in college, their most formative relationships were with their coaches. Uh, because those are the people often more so than their professors, who asked of them that they give 100% and who knew them really well, who knew what they were capable of. You know? and, and so those are tremendously formative relationships. And, and I see uh, athletics as the, um, the vessel within which character is often formed, sometimes misformed. You know, but at its best, it encourages qualities of fairness, of self-reliance, of cooperation and teamwork. Uh, but again, you know, it's important to realize that this varies from sport to sport. So you get a certain kind of reliance in, uh, say, playing basketball that you wouldn't necessarily get in archery or long distance running. So, uh, or, you know, you get something yet different in water polo, you know, where you're under water half the time, you know. So how you, uh, you know, they, they, each sport has its own distinctive signature in regard to the kinds of characteristics that it develops. Overall, in regard to the place of that in society, you know, ideally, uh, sports would be one of those things that would help shape young people into productive and resilient members of society. Because that's another thing inevitably sports teaches you is to be resilient. You know? And that's one of the reasons why it's, I think, so incredibly important that sports be uh, something that's equal for both men and women in high schools and colleges and even at, at, at an earlier age. The difficulty, of course, is that there are different, there are men's teams and, and women's teams. So they make, one might come out with all these qualities, but still not know how to play well across the gender gap, you know, and that's, uh, and to the extent that that's true, uh, I, I think we all get diminished by that. So the last two words, ethics and, car uh, and um, culture? Um, ethics and culture, um, I mean, I, I see sports as inculcating just really valuable ethical lessons. So, you know, the, that part. I think it's also a part of, uh, of most cultures in different ways. You know, so you think about the way in which, for example, baseball is this sort of quintessentially American, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 you know, uh, pastime that, that partially defines who we are, but it also provides bridges to other, uh, other cultures. So for, think about Castro, you know, he, he didn't make it in the major league, so he became a dictator. But, you know, uh, but, the, but, you know, we have that common bond with Cuba. We all love baseball, 
you know, so, um, and then you think about the way in which it sometimes divides, you know, the British, India, and cricket. Go figure. I mean, you know, I've never, uh, I, I have good friends who find cricket a really compelling and engrossing <laughs> sport. Uh, it is beyond me. So, you know, so th these are tied up with who we are as citizens, uh, historically, uh, bridging cultures, but also creating some divides. We just had an online session this past uh, two weeks uh -huh. on a, a variety of issues, one of which was uh, religion and character, religion and ethics, religion and sports. And we oh. read several articles. Uh, the latest one that the, the students read was uh, by Meacham on uh, Tebow and Tebowing. Oh. How, what's your view of this demonstration of God playing a role in, in uh, uh, particularly professional sports, I suppose? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, no one considers me a theologian, so uh, we'll begin with that disclaimer. Right. That that said, it just seems like bad theology to start with. You know, I mean, there there might be something you you know on some level sweet to think that God is rooting for you, but I mean, really, you know, uh, if he is, we're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, and if he isn't, we're in a different kind of trouble. But that one just doesn't turn out well. So these demonstrations, you'll, you'll see um, Tebow, for example, kneeling in the end zone, scored a touchdown in prayer. Yeah. Or baseball players thumping their chest and raising their hand to the sky. What, what's the sense? Well, If someone, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about Tebow or anything. So, uh, you know, if someone kneels in humility and, and says, you know, in effect, the universe, you know, it's more than me. Mm -hmm. I, I find that admirable and also true. You know, uh, if on the other hand, someone points to the sky and says, God's on my side, that makes me worried, you know, and hopefully they're just throwing a baseball yeah. and nothing that explodes when it lands. Uh, so I, I, I am very wary of that. Okay. Um, what would you say can we hold? Sure. Can you cut it for a second? Yeah. I, I want to ask. Um, well, let me sort of wrap it up with a couple of things, one of which is not actually about ethics, but it is about sports. You know, um, if you play sports and you play them well, so I've already knocked myself out of the you know, the running on this, you know, you sometimes find yourself in the zone, whatever the zone yeah, may be, right. whether it's tennis or, yeah. you know, basketball or what have you, you know, and one of the things that you really experience about that is when you're in the zone, you become oddly selfless. And this is the thing that contradicts the sort of media hype about about athletes and the like, you know, when you look at someone like I used to watch Michael Jordan, you know, and when he was there, you know, he just flowed with the whole game. And that experience of flow, I think, is absolutely crucial, you know, not just in sports, but in life as well. You know, and the more that we're able to find the to attune ourselves to situations such that we can sort of flow through it and respond fully to what's there in the moment the the better off we're going to be and everyone else around us you know so so i think sports provides in that sense a metaphor for life um i you know and i like that metaphor much better than just the competitive win lose kind of metaphor that often is drawn from sports um the other thing that i just return to is the fact that i really do think this is just such an amazingly important opportunity for the formation of character. 
and that uh, when sports is seen in that fashion and when coaching is seen in that fashion, you know, not about winning, but about shaping the kids you're, you're coaching, uh, then it's, you never lose, you know, I mean, every game is a win on some really basic level if you're able to bring from those kids the best of who they are and who they can become. And when you can do that, you got it.